it's not cheating, but you know, if you just cared about the answer and um, and you uh, you just want to get the answer quickly here, you don't um, you don't care to follow the actual directions that are given here. You know, calculate the moment of inertia by direct integration. Then then uh, you can quickly obtain the answer this way, which is. Um, so let me show you the shortcut way first, just so that we can get to the answer, and then um, I'll do it properly. Um, which is, um, so it's good to have uh, memorized some of the rotational inertia formulas. Uh, I have this formula memorized, rotational inertia of a rod, or um, about its end point is equal to one third mass of the rod times its length squared. So I can actually apply this. I can use a superposition principle. Think of this like a two rods separated, one here and you know another there. And I just plug in the correct values of mass and length. Um, so lengths are already there, I can use that. And mass is where I have to be careful <laughs> because it's a 14 M for the entire thing. So it's gonna be, um, 14 over 3m for this and 28 over 3m for this. So, all right, let's write down the total rotational inertia. That's gonna be left end of rod, which will be one third times the mass there, 14 over 3m um, times the length squared, which is uh, the third over L. So L over three, squared plus the rotation inertia from the right hand side. So that's one third uh, mass there, 28 over three, and, and then the length there, 2L over three squared. Um, you can see that when you uh, carry out the calculation here, one ML squared is gonna factor out. So the rest is doing the numerical calculation in between to get this reduced fraction A over B. So uh, let me, let's just do that. So it's uh, gonna be, the first term is gonna be 14 divided by three times three times nine. So oh, 81 plus, um, it's gonna be 28 times four. So, uh, sorry, I'm kind of confusing myself. Four times eight is I think 32. Why, why, why am I? No, 36. Why? No, <laughs> 32. 32 was right. Okay, uh, so 32 plus, um, okay, so one, one, two. Uh, let me just do this in calculator to be sure. 28 times four. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired and cranky probably. Um, yeah, one, one, two, good. <laughs> All right, uh, divided by, oh, I guess 81 again, because it's three times three times nine, divided by 81. Okay, that makes it easier to combine this fraction. It's gonna be um, one to six, one to six over 81. Looks like both are divisible by nine, so let's do that. Um, so nine and then one, four. All right, so it should be 14 over nine. And when you do, you will get that to be the correct answer. Uh, but you know, I won't end this there because um, really the point of this question wasn't, I mean, you know, I, this is actually a good technique to know, which is why I did it. But if you're doing this question properly, it is asking you to do this by direct integration not to uh, use a superposition principle, although you could, and my open net has no way of knowing. So let me do this one more time, one last time by direct integration. Calculate the moment of inertia by direct integration of a thin rod of some mass and length L about an axis through the rod at um, L over three as shown below. Okay, so, um, where do I start? So, 
This is, uh, there's a reason we put some time, some emphasis into this in our physics foray. And it has to do with um, something that we are hoping to build you up to in anticipation of what I think we have, you have to do in physics 4B. So, and, and that is an ability to kind of uh, look at a complex problem, recognize that it can be broken down into a smaller manageable chunk, express the smaller manageable chunk, and then use that to work out a solution for the whole big thing. You've seen an example of this when you saw me lecture on the poten spring potential energy because you have a variable force, work done by that variable force can't be done just as simply as force times distance. So what you have to do is you break up the distance interval into an infinitesimal pieces. You express the infinitesimal work for, done for the infinitesimal piece, and then you add it up using integral. And that's what you have to do here. So the very first step that you have to do here is to express that infinitesimal piece. Um, I like to do it as a kind of a representative piece uh, first. So I have this entire rod. And the idea here is that I can be looking at basically any portion of this rod. So let me just uh, take a piece here. And um, I can parameterize this piece, as in I can refer to that piece by its uh, coordinate position, location x. And um, this is what I can say about rotational inertia of this tiny little piece. If I knew the mass of that tiny little piece, I can say that for this tiny little piece. Its rotational inertia about this axis here is gonna be, so the tiny little <laughs> rotational inertia of the tiny little piece. It's small enough that I can treat it like a point mass. So I write down the formula for rotational inertia of a point mass. Mass times the distance squared. So this is the starting place. And this is a kind of a representative piece in that the x is a variable. You can let x vary all the way from x equals minus l over 3 to all the way to x equals 2l over 3. That um, identifies position of each one of those pieces. And using that, uh, using this variable, you can address the entire rod you can add, um, this is how you, we are going to do the integration. Then there's a bit of a um, um, hurdle you have to pass, which is that this uh, dm here is not expressed in terms of your um, coordinate variable. It's kind of a dm, it's a schematical symbol. It, it's an, um, like when you integrate, what do you do with that? I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> What you need to do is you need to express this dm in terms of this coordinate variable. And this is where you kind of think through it and then you realize, oh, it doesn't say it, but it says a thin rod. So I think a uniform is implied. So you can associate the amount of mass that's in that portion with the kind of the size of that little piece, dx. So, if this rod has a linear mass density lambda, then this uh, mass dm here can be represented this, this way. dm will be the density times the small interval dx. So when you have that, now it's something you can, you recognize as something you can integrate. Oops. Um, di is equal to lambda dx x squared. So it's an integral, it, you can form an integral in terms of x. 
And lambda is going to be a constant. Let's work out the constant and just write it into our expression. So linear mass density, that's the amount of mass, um, 14m, per length, L. And if it's uniform, then it's, this ratio is going to be the density throughout. And just so you know, um, the way we assess if you know how to go through this process is uh, I will give you a non-uniform lot. So um, doing this integral is the only way you can figure out the rotational inertia. Once again, not for exam two, but uh, for a future exam, I'll do that. So um, you have the linear mass density. So let me just plug that in. So um, this is kind of a beginning setup of your integral. Um, DI, the, the infinitesimal rotational inertia, due to that infinitesimal segment dx is a 14 m over l dx x squared. And uh, let me swap this order here so that it's kind of clear. Uh, sorry, I need to do this with the mouse. Um, let me swap this order here so that it's kind of uh, clearer what's in the integrand, what's the variable of integration, and you can recall the formulas that are relevant here. Okay, so I'm integrating with respect to x. And when I do integrate, what I'm doing basically is I am integrating over the entire rod. When I do that, I should get the rotational inertia of the rod. That's what I should get. So what does it mean to integrate over the rod? Well, uh, it, this is kind of why we want the coordinate variable. You can do it in terms of the coordinate variable as x varies from minus L over three to 12 over three, you have addressed the entire rod. So I let X go from minus L over three to 12 over three. And when I work out this right-hand side, that should give me the answer. And now if you're looking at, um, I mean, is this minus okay? Like, am I doing something um, unphysical? Um, this is something you will begin to see more and more as you go to higher levels, which is where you write down your expression so that uh, negative signs are meaningful. And this uh, kind of a weird looking integration limit is perfectly valid. There's nothing wrong with it. When we work out the answer, you will see that I got the correct answer. Um, it, uh, it's kind of a more formal way of setting up problem solving. We don't do a lot of that in physics for a and you will begin to see a kind of shift into that as you're going to higher levels of physics, engineering, and math. So um, let me factor out all the constants that don't matter. So it's a 14 m over L, doesn't matter in the integration. So um, I have this relatively simple uh, integrand that I use power rule. So the, the antiderivative of that ought to be one third X cubed. You can always double check by imagine taking derivative of this. See if you get x squared back. If you do, great, move on. <laughs> so having this antiderivative, you evaluate it at the limit of 2L over three to minus L over three. So evaluating at the limit means you plug it in and you take the difference of the upper limit to lower limit. So uh, let's write it out, 14M over L times plugging in the upper limit, it's a one third, oh, um, sorry, I, too many cubes. Two cubed is eight times L cubed over three cubed is 27 minus one third. And I plug in minus L over three cubed. So I'm gonna get minus still L cubed over three cubed is 27. All right, uh, minus the signs cancel, so I get plus. This seems reasonable, I should be adding stuff. Some factors of L cancel out, so I get end up with L squared, which is good. Um, I do need ML squared, and it looks like I have that, and L squared, that will factor out. So the rest is a matter of working out, oh, if a 14 is what I'm gonna get, I hope all this adds up to one over nine. <laughs> so it's a eight over 81 plus one over 81. So all of this will add up to nine over 81. Yeah, that adds up to one over nine. So 14 times one over nine gives me that.
So yeah, it, I get the same answer. I get the same right answer. So yeah, this is, um, once you kind of get the hang of it, this is actually not very difficult, but we've seen many students uh, struggle with it because it's a uh, kind of, it's conceptually new. It's the kind of thing, I don't think you really learn it that uh, thoroughly even in your calculus two class. Um, and like when you get good at setting up integrals like this is when you, um, you know you're getting good at physics problem solving because many people do struggle with it.